as we start, uh, I was reflecting upon last week. So Sister Mallory uh, brought the word of a radical belief. And so each week in each service, we should ponder upon the thoughts and, and, and where that is going. And I took her comments as um, radical as next level. And, and the thing is, is with our faith, if we're comfortable, if we're here day in, week in and week out, if we're not pushing to the next level, call it radical, call it what you want. If you're not pushing to the next level, then you're not pr progressing, you're not maturing in Christ. Our walks are to mature. And then to fast forward, we had Pastor Gordon uh, this last Sunday, and he continued uh, the word on uh, follow the path. And one thing that Pastor Gordon was mentioning is, uh, he's mentioned it before, be the chief servant of them all and be humble. But my takeaway from this last week was uh, with Mallory, is basically you need to kick your faith up a notch and get going in life. And then actually with Pastor Gordon, you need to lower it down a notch and go more humble and be unselfish. And so I think if we do those two directions in life, we'll be just fine. Um, so I'm going to continue the series of Follow the Path. And I think the, the, the world itself and following, there's a path that everyone follows. In today's world, I think they may view Christians or believers as uh, a cheesy Christian movie or something like that. That's all this Christian folks role. Or um, it could be... Um, uh, it, uh, it also could be, um, if I'm scratching, uh, it, it, it could be, um, you know, if we have good times, Christianity is okay. If it's bad times, you must not be a good Christian. And I don't believe in that. I believe in our path and our journey. And I believe in what we need to do is have our spiritual eyes, our spiritual eyes to see within this world. Because what we have is... Um, our spiritual eyes, um, with, with what that, we look with spiritual eyes, and we're going for the microphone, um, you have spiritual eyes or you have the natural eyes. And we need to go with the, with the spiritual eyes to guide us in life with the path. Here's the thing is, I think um, the one biggest challenge we have in this world is that we live, is that we live in a uh, perverse culture in world. And that's okay. We know that. Um, our job is to how we navigate through this world and our, on our path in life. Uh, and we navigate that with our spiritual eyes. You know, show the first slide, please. So this is actually point one. Um, so before we... Oh, there we go. Thanks, Nate. Uh, so I, I, I threw Nate for a twist tonight. I had some slides. So the reason I wanted to show this here, as an unbeliever, and maybe sometimes as a believer, our path in life can look this way. So our path in life is supposed to be a straight and narrow path towards God. But it's not quite so straight and narrow. On this path, in this picture here, we see a guy, and he's going with the world. If you go with the world, this is what your path's going to look like. You will go left, and you will go right. And you will sway with the world and you'll sway with your emotions. And you notice the man is by himself. And another thing is what you see in this picture here, I see it as the way of the world, is where is the man going? So in our path in life, our path to follow, where are we going in life? This man is of the world, I believe. So at the end of that path, there is no ending. There's water I call the abyss. So for the unbeliever, um, that's why we need to bring them onto the path. That's what I see them as. Please take the slide down. The title of tonight's message is, How Are You Following Your Path? So now we go to bullet point one. And with this one here, uh, uh, the first point is, faith keeps me on my path and protects me. And what I mean by that, here's what Paul says. Paul tells us faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is in your heart before you have it in your circumstances. So you have to have faith. The stronger your faith is, and so in your circumstances, the trials and tribulations, the tough times of life, the stronger your faith, the, the better you can navigate through them. You have to make the choice and make the best choice of your path that you will follow. You know, my mother has a saying, 
at her house. And we're talking about faith and how faith protects us. My mother has um, a saying that says, uh, faith is when you close your eyes and you open your heart. And if you can truly close your eyes and open your heart when you walk in life, that's faith in God. That's trust in God. So I dare you to close your eyes and open your heart. And where does faith come from? Faith is not conjured up. You're not initially born with it. You're not really, you can build your faith through studies and stuff like that. Everyone has faith in something. My faith, my faith is in the sovereignty of God that he is all in control. And my faith is also in his son who was nailed to a cross on a piece of wood. That's where my faith is. You know, Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians that faith is a gift from God, not because we deserve it or have earned it or are worthy to have it. It is not from ourselves. It is from God. That's where your faith comes and you grow with Christ in your faith. It is not attained by our power or free will. You know, and why do I have faith? We have faith for one reason, to believe in God and give us purpose in life. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God. So right there, God says, If you don't have faith, you're not with me. It is impossible to please God. So you must have faith. Find your faith. Seek your faith. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly, earnestly seek him. You know, in Luke 7, um, Jesus was talking with a woman. Uh, they, 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 scripture calls it a sinful woman. Well, I'm a sinful man. So he talks with a sinful woman and they're conversing back and forth. And what happens is the woman realizes her faith. She realizes she's sitting beside the Messiah the true Messiah that the Hebrews have always been waiting for. And, and for some reason, she gets the epiphany of Christ that he is the Messiah. And what God said, what Jesus said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. So faith, you have to have faith or you cannot please God. You know, finally, faith is what sustains us to the end knowing that by faith we will be in heaven with God for all eternity. You know, 1 Peter 1, 8 through 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an expressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Examples of faith um, are... Uh, you know, we can go all the way back to Abel, being honest with God and faithful and giving him the portion that he deserves. Faith. Think about Noah. First thing I think about Noah is all the cute characters and everything like that. And, and, and it is cute. But if you think about Noah, Noah went for decades and years and years, and he had faith in God. And also with Noah, his family had faith. So I would express to you that um, within your metron, your faith spills over also. We have Abraham who left Isaac and he was going to sacrifice his son in faith. That one there, I don't know if I could do that to my son. Um, my faith just quite isn't there yet. Um, and we also have, you know, I was thinking about faith and I was thinking about Rahab, the prostitute. Rahab takes in two spies into the city. And by faith, her soul is saved. So where is your faith? You know, and I think with faith, what makes us any different than people of the Bible? This, this scripture was written in 2023. There is no time to God. So it's written from yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And our faith, what's the difference between us and these uh, great men and women of yesteryear. There is no difference than them and us. God has placed them in certain circumstances. He has tested them and tried them and elevated their faith. So he has used them for their purpose, but I think we are no different. 
with our faith, the one thing I would do is we always want to look forward in life. We don't want to look in the rear view mirror and relive it. But I think it's good sometimes if you look back over your left shoulder and you should look at your faith markers in life. You want to know where your faith is? And faith is so hard because faith is something you can't see, but you believe. So you should examine your life and you should look over your left and right shoulder and you should find the markers in life. Usually they're during the trials and tribulations of life. But look at the times when you rose in your faith. You know, I was taking a, a walk with my middle son, Kevin, uh, in Falls City a couple days ago. And so it was, it was a heavy conversation. And so we started talking about faith. And Kevin was looking at faith um, logically. And you can't look at faith logically. And you have to believe and receive from God and the Holy Spirit. That's the only way you're going to embrace the faith. You know, in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. You know, I think through our faith also through this uh, final point uh, for this first point is uh, God will protect us. When we are on the right path, we will stumble. That's okay. But we, we will be protected by God. You know, we must never accept sin, but when we're truly following God, he will establish our footsteps. And the one thing I want to go into is Psalms 37, 23 through 24. The Lord delights in a man's way. He makes his steps firm. The thing is, is if the Lord makes my steps firm, I'm walking on my path in life. If my steps are firm, it's like the, the story of the foundation of the house. If I'm solid in my walk, I'm solid with the Lord. And the Lord will protect me and I'll be on solid ground. Through his, though he stumbles, he will not fail for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Here's the thing right here. What God says, so when we walk in faith, we're walking down a road. Our sinful nature will screw up whatever it is, however it's defined. But within this here, the Lord upholds me with his hand. So I know when I walk down the road, I will stumble, but I will never fall before the Lord. I have this picture of the scripture that Jesus has a hand here and Jesus has a hand here. And when I walk, he's walking with me. Most of the time, I don't realize it because I'm not thinking about him, which I should be. But Christ is to our left and to our right. So when you think you're alone, you're not alone. He's to your left and he's to your right. We are protected even through our trials and tribulations of stage three, divorce, Bell palsy, um, depression. And this doesn't mean we're on a wrong path. It means we're building my, God is building my faith and character. And when I overcome these, I overcome everything. God will never give us something. Temptation, I get that there. But anything else, God will always equip us and never give us something that we cannot overcome. So how do you overcome it? It's by your faith. Check this out. Remember that in this lifetime, God does not remove all of our enemies, Matthew 13, but rather he blesses us in the presence of our enemies as a witness to his greatness, Psalm 23. The second point I'd like to talk about tonight is uh, speaking God's language. Um, on our path, if we don't speak God's language, we can't, we don't know where the path is. The path is God. So we have to understand the language. And I was thinking about this. Do you ever um, talk with your spouse and there's a topic? And I'm not going to say uh, Monica and Steve, but if there's a topic before you, and if you go, you, 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 or you, 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 and you go back and forth and back and forth, and, it, and you just don't, you, you're, you're not on the same wavelength. You're not on the same language. You're not understanding each other. And so, um, and just one more example is, um, you know, when I was in a seminary, I, I had uh, my first six months of Hebrew. Uh, the first three weeks was extremely horrible 
because Monica knows that I had flashcards, felt like thousands of them around the, in the cars and everything, and I, I, I couldn't learn Hebrew. And so I called the professor after three weeks into it, and I, I talked to her, and she chuckled, and I says, I don't care I, how much I have to pay for the class, I'm done. This is nuts. And uh, she says, no, 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 Steve. Hebrew and English, there's no correlation between them. So a left back gimel de let hey wa a b c d e f g there's no correlation and so and, and it set me on the right path and the one thing is about speaking God's language this is God's language this is the truth of God and when we go through it we learn about God if it's the language that we have to learn is this if it's not this then it's of the world so we can't learn about God in the world. We have to learn it through the language of God. You know, there's, uh, did you know that if you read your Bible for 15 minutes a day, and I understand that you can get stuck on a verse or a portion of a verse for several days, if you read your Bible for 15 minutes a day, in one year, you'll read through the whole Bible. So I'm sure you're reading your Bible and getting through this at least in two years, every time. Tonight, and I'm in understanding God's language, and we need to write it down, read it, believe it, and think about it, and meditate upon it. But did you, did you know that um, you will forget 95% of what I'm saying tonight in, 30, in 72 hours? So I am so thankful that you have your, your phones out with, your, with your, your old pad there and everything, your notepads, and you're taking notes. And that's some sarcasm there. But we should write it down. I just, I forget everything. So I'm, I'm classified uh, in that area. But this is of um, God's language. Uh, and we just need to learn it and meditate upon it. You know, speaking God's language through prayer. So these are Steve's isms. So um, some of the isms, I think, you know, when you pray and learning God's language, this is reading. Our verbal relationship is through praying. Pray out loud. Always pray out loud. I know for me, because my mind will drift left and right. So me personally, I have to pray out loud. And, you know, and also uh, set a timer. I know this sounds trivial. But have you ever set a timer on your prayer? I pray every minute. I know a long time ago when I first started praying, I said, I'm going to pray for 15 minutes. So I put my little cell phone down, and I went about three or four minutes, and I have to admit, I kept going like this, and I kept peeking at it, and I just gassed out. Um, the thing is, with the prayer, the more you do it, the more comfortable it is in your relationship. It, it works, so you need to get into it. You know, I'm going to go so far as to equate prayer with tithing. And you got to hold, just, just stay with me. My math's wrong on this one. But you know how when we tithe, God gives us 90%. All we have to do is give God 10% back. That's it of our gross pay. And he just wants to bless us. So just imagine if you prayed. There's 24 hours in a day. Say you prayed, give, give God back 10%. So what would that be? Maybe 2.4 hours? That'd be pretty daunting. So here's the thing is, we will give me time 99% and we will give God 1% of our day. So for 24 minutes, do you at least give God 1% of your day? That, <laughs> this is how Steve looks at it. And um, I just, to keep it in perspective, uh, maybe I'm too logical, uh, but um, give your time to the Lord. Here's what the mindset, the last thing in, in, in speaking with the, the God's language, our mindset of this. Have the mindset of Christ and think within an eternal perspective. This is how Jesus handled pain, and this is how you handle pain. What is unbearable is pain without purpose. We're lost without purpose, especially through pain. Human beings can stand an enormous amount of pain, but if we see a purpose through the pain and we see a reward past the pain, 
So when we're with God, we can see we have to have a purpose through the pain or we're wandering. We're wandering on that first road like that man in life and his pain is left and right. Watch what Jesus did on the cross. He went to the cross as a man being crucified and he knew that what would happen, but he looked past the pain to the eternal rewards and what his father told him to do. If you are just looking at the here and now, you will be discouraged and depressed. So have purpose on your path. Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's progress into the third point. Travel together. Traveling together on your path. So you have to follow your path in life. We have to be together. To stay together, we mature together in what we do. If, if we're traveling alone in life, the roaring lion, Satan, the dumb stuff in life, Satan will put that before us. And we're stronger together as a threefold cord. Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. You know, when Jesus was about to go to the cross, he started praying to the Father. And I didn't catch this in Scripture for a long time. He went, one of the last times he prayed. So, Father, Father, Father. And then he said, uh, then he started praying for everyone. And that's how Jesus ended. And in John 17, 20 through 21, this is what Yeshua said. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And what that means is if we're not intertwined together, will wander off. You know, as we travel together, you need to ask yourself, and you really need to answer this, who's your buddy? And I know I'm kidding around a little bit like that, but I know I have different buddies for different reasons. My, I know my wife, Monica, uh, she's my biggest cheerleader, and she will support me. And what we do is how we're buddies in life it's like even Wednesdays and Sundays, we will talk about after service and throughout the week what was said. And we will try and grow with that. And we'll actually go back in the scripture and find out more and more. So like Sunday service is just the start. When Pastor Gordon, Pastor David or whoever is here, that's only the start to what is being taught. And so I know I kid around, but you really need to write this stuff down where, however you want to capture it. And we need to grow with it uh, little by little. Um, my pastors, and I say that, I don't say that because Pastor David's here. And, uh, I know like Pastor Gordon, uh, I just, uh, one of my buddies, I mean, uh, not disrespectfully. And, uh, it's like, we went to see someone in the hospital on Thursday up in Seattle. Now on the way back, I appreciate Pastor Gordon. Cause when I asked him a question, cause I asked him about how we navigate in this perverse culture and world, it's nuts. He's like, oh no, it's not nuts. I mean, we just have to navigate through it and, and follow on the path of life. So I appreciate Pastor Gordon. And the next person, he may not acknowledge me, but it's actually Pastor David. I mean, uh, and I appreciate Pastor David. And uh, we talk more business here and uh, the, the functions of the ministries and stuff like that. But the one thing I appreciate about Pastor David he always brings it back to scripture. And everything we do, he brings it back to scripture. So whether it's the secular world or whatever you're at, and whatever you do should come back into the thoughts of God. And then I have two buddies. I have one in Seattle, and I, and I have one in San Diego. My San, uh, San Diego buddy, you should, you should have about two or three buddies in life. Uh, the San Diego guy, Edmund, we talk theology. You can call it wherever you are. We kind of... It, it, we just kind of go through scripture and stuff like that, and we just wander right through it. Just wander right, what does God want? What's he doing? Now, you should have a buddy that you can talk to about the word and your struggles in life. 
And the next point is being spirit led on your path. The thing is, is the lamp to your feet, uh, the straight and narrow path. uh, The spirit is the light of your path. So let the spirit lead you on your path. You will know you are on the right path when the Holy Spirit in you puts your conscience at peace because your life is in alignment with God's prescribed will. Acts 2.28. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Being spirit led. I want to talk about uh, open and closed doors. And I'm going to bring up my wife one more time, just because that's the only illustration I can find. Um, But I was thinking about the open and closed doors. And so Monica went through um, about a year and a half ago. Uh, She got, uh, I learned from her and she got an incredible opportunity down Silicon Valley. Compensation package, Steve doesn't have to work. That would not happen. But, but seriously, though, it was at that level. So her 30 years of experience, uh, it was right up her wheelhouse. Everything was before her. So she went before the Lord. What do you say, Lord? After a couple of days, the Lord said no. She did question the Lord, but she did not go against what the Lord said. So she didn't do it. So many months later, there was a lot of problems within that area of the company and it kind of imploded in that area. God was protecting Monica from that door. The thing is, is open and closed doors. We ask God, show me the open and closed doors. The thing is, is we ask God too much. We want him to open and close the door. You close the door and you open the door by obedient by being obedient to God. That's what Monica did. She slammed that door shut. We're not going to revisit. Let's move on to something else. So I think a lot of the onus can be put on us being obedient what God says when opening and closing doors. You know, and being spirit-led, one thing is uh, God's will is sovereign and prescribed. So we're walking down the path of life is the sovereignty of God is everything's predestined. But we also have the prescribed will of God. And what that is, God sets it before us, but he'll give us a choice. And so we have to choose the right choice. Second Corinthians 7, 9. As it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through this. So this is being spirit-led. When you go off the path and you know, you can call it doing wrong, you can call it, you can say you just boned it up and you did something wrong. If you don't feel the conviction of the spirit, just a little tug in your heart, you need to check yourself a little bit. Um, the spirit will always push you. He won't push you strong because you have to make your decision. The spirit will always push you towards the path. Remember, Jesus will never let you fall. He's to your left and your right. It's kind of like the Holy Spirit is a lamp to your feet. So you just have to follow the Spirit and trust by the Spirit in life and trust that Jesus is to your left and your right and he will catch you. Fifth point. Lead your metron by your actions and influence others by your love. So I have some examples for this one here. Our Metron, uh, Pastor Gordon uses all the time, call it first degree of separation. Call it your closest family members. Call it your, call it your BFF. I, I don't know what, what you call it. But uh, who's closest to you? You know, uh, First lesson, Thessalonians uh, 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. So your first degree of separation, the people closest to you, you should always encourage them. Um, even for coming up here tonight, I got texts from San Diego, San Jose, and actually uh, Bryson sent me a text. Yay, Dad! And so, I mean, it, it does mean a lot. I mean, even we always think spouse to spouse, adult to adult, um, but kiddos uh, mean a lot also. So lead your metron. So it's not... I took an example, because yes, my mother's here from Michigan, so I'm going to use her as an example. 
And so I was thinking about, you know, at the lowest point in my, so lead your Metron. That's not you, and it can be people parallel to you, side by side to you also. So a long time ago, I was going through a divorce. Uh, lowest time of my life. And so I called my mom, and I says, hey, I'll be home in two days. And the wise old mom says, okay. And she'll just take it from there, and she'll prepare. So I go home. I wanted space. That's all I wanted. So a couple days later, uh, my mom said, hey, uh, you want to go up to the church about a half mile away, United Methodist, um, all 15 of them. And, uh, it, but it, it was, it's wonderful. Um, we went up there and she says, Hey, you want to sharpen pencils? You want to clean up? Yeah, let's, let's go up there and, and serve the Lord. Let's clean up the house. Let's get it ready for Sunday service. So we go up there and, and so we're working away and, and this is how my mother led me. So it was her initiation upon me. I never would have went up there. And so she has to leave early to go do something. And then the pastor comes in, Pastor Ron. So we sit down for a long time. Ron reads right through me. And uh, it's a long time. And so I leave that church. And so uh, I go to my car across the street on a country road. There's a church, there's a post office, and there's a bar, literally on a country road. And it's at this corner. So Ron, Pastor Ron comes over and... Uh, I accepted Christ on that country road. And it's a story for a different day. But if it wasn't for my mother leading me, my Metron is connected. And so she, in a way, was an initiation in leading me to the Lord. You know, um, one other thing is in your Metron. Uh, Pastor Gord talks all the time about supporting your families and everything. And how do you support your kids? And, and uh do you read scripture to them at nighttime? Okay, let's read Proverbs, uh, the whole uh, uh, 63rd chapter. Um, you can do it in different ways. And this may seem quirky, but how I, my 16-year-old son, uh, Bryson, so uh, he's a footballer. Uh, I'm proud of him. He got the, uh, they were the best defense in the state of Washington this year for their, for their level. And so what I would do with Bryson is I would always go um, on the chain gang. So I'm the guy who holds the marker with the dad bod. And uh, so I was always there because what I liked with Bryson, so how do you encourage your Metron? How do you encourage your kids? So what I would do is on the field is the ref, is the chain gang coach, and the teams are back here. And you hear everything that's going on. You hear all the words, the snorts, the, everything. Um, so one time the sideline judge, and, and what I liked about Bryson, he's a cornerback. He's a defensive cornerback. So I can be from here to Pastor Will, and, and I can talk with Bryson in a way. So one time, I like to encourage Bryson during the football games. So he gets burnt on about, eh, it's only an eight-yard play, but he gets burnt, and he's all ticked off. You can see it and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, the sideline judge, chain gang, chain gang, on me. It's like, don't be sending signals. We're, like, We're looking at each other. We're just a bunch of dads just helping out. So come to find out. So how I encourage my son on the football field, because I know football is his life. Besides God, well, football is very close. So what I do with, with Bryson is I will go, Bryson, Bryson, like that. I get his attention, and I did it. And I, and, I, and I go like this to him. And then what I do is this is our signal for strength in the Lord. So stop thinking Get your strength from God. So get your head straight. You ask him for help because obviously you screwed up on the last play. And so we, that's how we would encourage each other. And so Bryson and I, our thing is strength in the Lord. And he knows I can be across a room. Anything, that, the quirkiness, how you learn how to, your metron, your kids, that's how I communicate with Bryson. Strength in the Lord. That's just an example. You know, the, the last part of this is influence others by your love. And I want to start with just two examples about overcomers. Um, Pastor Winona uh, came and saw me a couple months ago. Uh, she's a deliverance pastor in counseling. Um, she says, hey, you need to go to Tacoma Hospital. And you see this lady. She's having some problems. Okay. So I go down to this hospital. And I walk into the room, and I can see it's her because she's like this. And, and she had some challenges why she was there. And it was, it was very, very busy in the room. People were coming and going. 
So I kind of navigated between the nurses and whoever else was there, and I grabbed a chair real quick, and I put it up against the, where she was laying. And so she grabbed my hand, and she wouldn't let go of my hand, and she pulled my hand inside the bed. And so we sat for at least a half an hour, 45 minutes. So I'm listening to her because she's deeply hurting. Just a sad, sad story. Kids, comments said, everything's not happening for her, why she's there. And then she says, and there was a man. And inside I'm like, a man? Okay, where's this going here? And she says, there was a man named Dr. Tom. And I'm like, no way. That cannot be our humble Dr. Tom from OCC. Come to find out it was. So what happened in Tacoma a month prior, Tom works for, well, Kaiser. And so he, she goes in there and just how God ordained this moment, how overcomers flow and how God uses us. He's up in Seattle. It's chaos. And she is not getting care. Tom witnesses to her right there in Kaiser, an outpatient. He brings her over. He, he doesn't know her. And then so the beauty of it is Tom invites her to OCC, and OCC sees her in Tacoma. And I think it's incredible how God works. He just interwove everything together. So if you think your actions don't matter, it's incredible what Tom did. That's just one story of Tom. I mean, he's just a sweet, humble man of God. You know, and I want to kind of start uh, coming off this here. And so here, um, another how we influence other people with love. Uh, we have a wonderful group. We have the weekly Ray of Hope. We always advertise here. We go out to Ray of Hope, help people at the Auburn shelter. So what we have is, is Linda and Harold who lead a devotion part of it. Uh, Melissa, many others go out there. And Pastor Jeanette, they administer to them. It's getting pretty full. So I just want to let you know, we talk about outreach. If you want to love on other people, here's a way you can do it. So we have a group starting up. They've already went out hard. And they, it's called a seat at the table. So they're going to go out to every third Saturday of the month. So they recently took out um, just how overcomers operate. They took out 40 huge meals. They want to grow this thing. You can see it's going to be a couple hundred huge meals every, they want to do it every week. So overcomers, how we act, how we serve, um, this is a place where you can get plugged in also. So the outreach uh, portion, if you want to do that, um, you can. So tonight what we've covered is um, following your path. So your path in life with God. Make sure the light is illuminated before your feet. If you see that light, the Holy Spirit, let the Spirit guide you in life. And please know that Christ is to your left and to your right. And as you walk in your path of life, you will influence so many around you. You have no idea. You've influenced me by coming here to OCC. We have an overcomer that, um, let's just say we influence each other in our own ways. And we need to embrace that um, and love each other for that there.